When new technology, science, or engineering appear in medical devices, how does FDA assess their safety and effectiveness? When existing devices malfunction, how does FDA verify the root cause of the problem? Scientists and engineers in FDA laboratories are asking these questions and finding the answers that help assure that the latest technology in medical devices is safe and effective for patients. In 2009, a patient underwent routine gastric band surgery, a widely done procedure designed to help severely overweight people achieve weight loss. The surgery went well, but a few weeks later, the band began to leak. Then the same problem occurred with another patient. What was the problem? And was it an indication of a larger, potentially more dangerous problem? Scientists at FDA's Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories who look at products before and after they enter the market began to investigate. FDA has a special program where we listen to the clinical concerns of healthcare professionals from across the country and this is called the Medical Product Safety Network. Through that network we had a report about a problem with a lap band that seemed to be leaking. An adjustable gastric band, frequently called a lap band, is a device that's used to treat obesity. It's a collar that's surgically placed around the top of the stomach. Then, using a needle that's inserted into a port implanted under the skin, liquid fills the collar, squeezing the stomach. This process works by making patients feel full more rapidly, so they eat less. The hospital was very concerned because they had to repair several different patients' lap bands and they weren't quite sure what the problem was. What they were noting at this hospital was that the lap band was leaking and therefore deflating. We needed to understand where in the uh, path of flow the leak was occurring. And we didn't know how widespread this was. Was this a problem just at this one hospital where we had the report? Was it a problem at many different hospitals who weren't thinking to report it to us? So when you get an initial report like this, you really have many different areas of concern. We looked at the problem and debated amongst ourselves, is this a indicator of a larger public health problem? And it felt like it could be. Therefore, we pulled together a group of experts from across the center and we talked about the issue and we called the uh, hospital together to find out what they thought the problem may be. Well, after some investigation at the hospital side, they determined that they didn't think the problem was with the lap band, but rather with the Huber needle that's used to inject saline into the lap band. Huber needles have been around since about 1946 when the patent was first issued. Huber needles are designed so that when the needle pierces a rubber septum, there is no hole left behind. The hole, in a sense, heals back up as the needle comes out. That's important if you're trying to maintain sterility or if you have uh, a need for uh, multiple punctures through a port and having no leakage after the fact. Ports aren't just used for lap bands. Ports are used in many different kinds of procedures. Most commonly, they're placed under the skin for chemotherapy purposes. So many cancer patients who are undergoing long-term chemotherapy will have a port placed under the skin, and then when they go in for their chemotherapy treatment, a Huber needle with the chemotherapy agent is placed through the skin into the port and goes into the patient's system. When a Huber needle cores, it actually cuts a piece of rubber out of the septum. That creates two potential problems. The first is that the material that the port is supposed to retain can leak out and go places where it should not. The second concern is that the foreign body could end up in the bloodstream, which can then be sent to the heart, sent to the lungs, and sent to the brain. We just weren't sure. That was one of the major reasons we wanted to go ahead and further understand the extent to which Huber needles do core beyond this one simple case. We realized, again, that this could be a problem well beyond that with just lap bands. This could be a problem for every patient undergoing chemotherapy with the port. So we brought the problem to one of our scientists who had a background in mechanical engineering and in manufacturing. He investigated 
the Huber needles to determine if we had a design problem or a manufacturing problem. The first question I ask myself, how do we test the needles with the lab band port to see if they create cores? We needed to figure out how to test the needles. We looked for and discovered that there was no standard design parameter for testing ports with different needles. So we designed our own test. That was a major part of our effort, was to come up with a test that we could validate and then we could share so that other people doing this sort of work, the manufacturers, our own internal organizations, could reliably reproduce the test and believe the data that they got. We had to determine, was this a problem with one batch or lot of needles, or was this a problem with all of the needles that were made? So we bought additional needles from the same batch, and we bought needles from different lots. When we tested uh, Huber needles, we were trying to follow of standard uh, medical practice, which uh, nurses use in uh, hospitals. So the lab invited me in to demonstrate how the port and the needle is used in real clinical practice on a patient. We use the same size needles, same type of needles, and the same size syringe. I started to see obvious difference in uh, production of these needles. I was not sure if this is a design problem or manufacturing problem. It appeared to be both a design issue and a manufacturing issue. The design issue was with the back heel of the needle's edge, where it was actually cutting the septum as it was entering the port. The manufacturing issue was that some designers had a good design, but they just couldn't produce it consistently each and every time. When FDA reviewed Huber needles, before this issue was brought to our attention, we were concerned with other issues related to a medical device review, such as biocompatibility, consistency of manufacture, other issues related to the performance of the device. Once we identified the issue, we brought to their attention that coring was also an important consideration in the review. We knew we had to take immediate action to inform the public of our findings, as well as to encourage manufacturers to review their manufacturing operations and, if necessary, perform a recall. We met with 10 of the largest manufacturers at FDA headquarters. FDA scientists presented their test findings and the Office of Compliance asked for specific details about how the firms would prevent defective products from getting on the market. We also informed the firms that we'd be following up with non-compliant manufacturers. After this, we advised our field offices on how to inspect these manufacturing facilities. We also developed safety communications, such as letters to firms, and a website to notify users and patients about this issue. In the end, a Huber needle manufacturer conducted a voluntary recall of more than two million Huber needles. FDA's public health responsibility spans the entire life cycle of medical devices, from the early development of a device, to the manufacturing of the device, and then to its use in the market. At any stage of a device's life cycle, FDA makes well-supported regulatory decisions based on the information available. We call it the total product life cycle. And the way this works in this particular instance is that one group received the issue, recognized that it was a problem, went to the group that would do the investigation and explore and find out what actually was the problem. Another group then was able to take regulatory actions that were needed to improve the product at the manufacturer level and the other group was then able to communicate the problem to all the hospitals so they all would become aware of the problem with Huber needles. This was an excellent example of the various elements within FDA working together to solve a problem. It involved publishing our results and we're partnering with industry to develop a standardized test method so all the needles can now be tested the same way. This new standard is very significant because once it is adopted by manufacturers, it will serve to assure FDA that the needles do not core. The testing procedures that we developed and the enforcement actions that took place because of the results that we uncovered now allow us to be assured that industry going forward either can identify their own problems or can assure us that they have now developed good manufacturing processes to ensure Huber needles don't core. 
signaling a public safety concern, identifying the problem, effective communication, working with industry to adopt a sustainable long-term solution. This is FDA at its most effective, achieving its mission. Mm -hmm.